to works. Democratizing 1. the one point seven. Let me read it. Outpace the S and P. So have I. Look not at the one brag. on the right. Look at that art. That's art. I like Keith Haring. The, Lowest you know, correlation. Do you know about Basquiat? Do I know about Basquiat? You really don't. Oh my God. We're approaching. 57? We're almost getting to nice territory. All right, Duncan. That's it. Thank you. Well done. Maybe a little <laughs> round job, of applause. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yo, oh shout out to my compound day ones. If you've been listening to the show, we are now on, what did we say, 56? Seven. 57? 50, that's a lot of shows. What do you think? Start packing it in? Have we said everything that we want to say? No? We'll do another. All right, we'll do one more. We'll do one more. <laughs> Last one. Uh, Alex Morris is here. Alex is the founder and author of The Science of Hitting, which is an investment research-based newsletter previous to The Science of Hitting. Alex spent 10 years as a buy-side analyst and was a contributing author for Guru Focus. You have an MBA from the University of Florida, yes? Factual, yes. All right, <laughs> and you're a CFA charter holder. Yes. When did you get your CFA? Oh, gosh, six years ago, I think. And you're a level three, right? Yeah. Not to yeah. brag, Thankfully. level four. Nice. <laughs> so a level four CFA can levitate. I don't know. I don't know if you know. You still have to pay the annual fee or no? No. <laughs> nice. I'm, I'm grandfathered in. It's All even right. better than levitating. First thing I wanted to ask you, I'm sure you've explained this elsewhere. Where does the name, the science of hitting come from? Sure. So Warren Buffett's, Buffett's referenced a couple times throughout his career, this Ted Williams book, Science of Hitting, where mm. Ted Williams broke down the strike zone into different cells and basically said, pitch in the sweet spot, I can bat 400. Bottom outside corner, I can only bat 230. So I'm either a Hall of Famer or maybe not even on a major league team. And he said, the difference between investing in baseball is there's no called strikes. I can just stand here all day and wait for that fat pitch. So that's, right. where, that's Ted, where I came Ted's going to have to swing at some point. Eventually, and Warren Buffett to. can go two years without buying anything. Yes. And then this year, he went crazy. Going crazy. This year, he's buying right everything he can. Yeah. He just went over 20, I think, yeah. right? I think so. Over 20 what? Billion? Percent of, per, no, percent of Oxy. Yeah, Occidental Petroleum yeah. keeps buying. And he's like, and he's been buying uh, Japanese stuff in recent years, and he's yeah. he seems to be uh, seems to be enjoying himself again. Uh, I have a I have a theory about why he sold the airline stocks. Uh -huh. You want to hear it? Yes, I, I think it's a good theory. I do. I th most of my theories are ridiculous. <laughs> this one, I'm I'm 99 sure I'm right. So one of the big criticisms of Warren Buffett in recent years is he doesn't practice what he preaches and he's not greedy when others are fearful. And at the bottom of the COVID panic, he blew out tops. He had the biggest stake in five airlines mm -hmm. and he blew them all out at once. Yep. And it's very easy to look at that and be like, oh, Buffett got scared or whatever. But actually, I think what happened was he was acutely aware of the negotiations that were going on between Congress and the airlines to keep them in business. Mm -hmm. And there was no way they could have shoveled tens of billions of dollars at these companies if the world's richest man was the largest shareholder. Like the yeah. optics of bailing Buffett out were like a non-starter. So he's actually a hero. So he's actually <laughs> a hero and never once, to my knowledge, took any credit for that. But if he hadn't sold, I really don't think those airlines were bailoutable. They might have all had to have gone through Chapter 11. How do you yeah. how do you grade this theory? Zero to 10. I think, I think it could be legit. Um, I mean, the other thing to remember, I, I think about Airbnb, where Brian Chesky says, CEO, says their business went from full speed to down 80% in well, six, the airlines six weeks. Well, the airlines were told by the government, you are out of, the, you are right. out of <laughs> business for the foreseeable future. Yeah. It wasn't like they voluntarily were like, let's stop flying. Like, that was it. It was yeah. done. So they, something had to have happened, but it would have been very, uh, it would have been very difficult optically to give them money. Yeah, with Buffett being the biggest shareholder, for sure. I and mean, he even, didn't have the money to replace what they gave them. So, and again, the severity of the slowdown. Like I think booking holdings, their their cancellations were larger than their gross bookings in <laughs> April of twenty twenty one. So they had negative, they, or twenty twenty. Sorry, so they had negative revenues for that month. I Negative mean, revenues. I mean, so <laughs> this many is a company that did a hundred billion dollars of business the year before. Do you think so, that? Do you think that <laughs> it was a crazy slowdown? Do you think that so many of the things from that time, which admittedly is like two years ago, but we've like forgotten so many incredible yeah. things that took place just because so many incredible once in a lifetime things happened all at once. Yeah, and there will be a bigger appreciation for what went on like five years from now. Yeah, I, I, I went back and looked. I wrote an article in, at some point in March 2020, and the article started, market was down 6% today. It's down 30% in the past 
six weeks or whatever it was. Yeah. And I just completely forgot in my mind like how severe and crazy that was so quickly. Yeah. When did you and start it, your Substack? I started it in April 2021. So I wrote that other article still on Guru Focus. All right. Uh, before we get too far into the show, I want to mention that Alex is generous enough that we're going to raffle off for listeners who hit our link. We'll, we'll put links in the show notes. Uh, a one-year subscription to The Science of Hitting, yep. which I subscribe to. And for those unaware, it is a site that does deep dives onto mostly blue chip companies that you know, Facebook, uh, Meta, Airbnb, the cable companies, Disney, all that sort of stuff. And it is phenomenal. I read everything that you write. So uh, this will be a way for, for an audience to So how does that, Mike, how does that work? How do we, how do we award that to someone? Well, you will hit a link that we, subs- that we uh, put out and we will randomly generate, like a raffle generator. Where are we putting this link out? My, my show notes, your show notes, the blogs, YouTube, right. everywhere. Okay, so you'll see it in the show notes. You'll see it. You of, can't miss it. You'll have, it. you'll have a shot at it. If you're listening to this for the first time, like on Friday, Saturday, something, you'll have a shot at it. So We need your email. We'll, we'll, it'll be easy to find. Give us your email and one lucky person is – what, what if we already have people's email? Does it matter? Starts over? Yes? Yeah, call they, they, can, they can submit again. Yeah. All right, so we're going to give away a year of Alex's site, and Alex's site is great. And uh, we're happy to do that for you guys. And if you don't win the year, you should still subscribe anyway because it's uh, – he's, he's how often are you writing? Every Monday and every other Thursday. So you keep to that discipline? Yeah. Are you, same kind of post on Monday and Thursday or – It just depends. So during earnings season, I'm updating ideas that I've written up previously or names okay. that I own. Um, I should have also said – I disclose everything that I own, percentage weightings and all the names. So anytime I make any changes in the portfolio, I tell people what I'm doing and why. So those can be periodic posts. And then I do some, you know, deep dives on new companies. Like I've done Nike recently, Chipotle, uh, a handful of others. Dude, there are so many great Substack writers yes, that are. I keep up with on a <laughs> weekly basis. There is so much content coming out. Yeah. Like good, like very high quality content. For sure. For sure. Um, I feel like a lot of them were seeking alpha and then said – why don't I just get myself paid to do the same thing that I'm already doing? Yeah. Do you find a lot of that? Yeah. I mean, it'll be interesting to see the the staying power for a lot of these ideas. As Mike and I were talking before we, we hopped on, you know, it's it's hard to do, especially if you don't have – it's not a full-time job, which for me it's a full-time job. But if, if you don't right. have the time to consistently put out content, it's just hard to keep people's attention, partly because there's so much good competition. Yeah. I mean, right. It's, it's not like – it's not like newsletter 1.0 where yeah. where there were no there was no barrier to entry. For sure. The barrier to entry now is if you don't get above a certain level of subs, it's not a business for you. Yeah, right? I mean that's partly why I went with the complete transparency on what I own and position weighting. So I was like, I got to find some way to try to take this up a notch and differentiate it, which I've found has been pretty helpful in terms of just establishing trust with readers more than anything else. All right, well you're doing it. You're doing the thing. So. I'm a fan. All right, let's start with uh, with uh, maybe some some uh, Andy Kessler. Did a, a post in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was an opinion piece. And the title was a bit provocative. The headline was like, rest in peace, big bull market. I don't want to talk about that. The part that he that he wrote about that I thought was very interesting and noteworthy is what will kick off the next bull market. And he said the next bull will be fueled by earnings growth from whatever drives productivity next. Forget last cycle's winners, find new ones. Next generation machine intelligence, geothermal energy, gene therapy. So anyway, I don't won't read the whole quote, but but I thought that was interesting in light of the fact that right now, today, literally. Wait, don't leave off this last part. What is it? So he names all these next generation technologies, and then he says something completely out of left field that starts out expensive, is dismissed by skeptics, and then gets relentlessly cheaper over decades, creating wealth for society. So that's a pattern that we've about- seen. 10 times. Sounds like he's talking about crypto punks. I was going to say, it's <laughs> got to be NFTs. But so today, um, Apple became the single largest component of, of any S&P 500 company going back to 1980. Huh. John, can we throw this chart up? So this chart that for the for the listeners is are the FANG stocks. Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Facebook divided by S&P, S&P 500. Oh, that's interesting. So we're showing relative strength of these companies. And the only one and there's really not even anything close that has had all-time highs relative to the rest of the market is King Apple. It's quick. It's Jeez. it's um, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, for a big company, for a company this size to still be doing what it's doing and executing at this level, yeah. I think a lot of this story is just about lock-in. Yeah. And nobody having come along and come up with a better ecosystem. Yeah. So everything I own is Apple. They, I mean, they've continued to build out the install base, and then they've done, to your point, on lock-in, they've done a fantastic job on services, and they just 
keep hitting that over and over and over again. And if you listen to companies like Match Group, which owns Tinder and other apps talk about this, they think regulation's coming on App Store and we'll see what that means if it happens. I'm still not totally convinced that they're, they're, they're talking their book when they say it's going to come. Because gonna every happen. one of these companies, what they all have in common is they're kicking up a third of the money they make on their app to Apple. Yeah. It's like, that's just how it is. Yeah. And there's uh, been small tweaks, but nothing really that meaningful. Well, didn't they beat uh, Epic Games in court? Yeah. They did, right? Yeah. And that the drum beat around that time was as loud as it's, it's not like that now. So. If they would have lost, <laughs> if they would have lost to Fortnite in court. So, uh, so basically Epic Games makes Fortnite, which has a huge player ecosystem, my son and other and others spending money to buy goods and costumes and what, whatever it's called, uh, skins, uh, on the game. And I think Epic was trying to come up with a workaround where people could pay them directly and not have that revenue go through iOS yeah. and hit Apple. Yeah. And Apple either kicked them off or threatened to kick them off and it yeah. ended up in court. It violated the rules. And Apple won. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, that feels like a precedent that would be tough for somebody else to challenge on different grounds. Yeah. I mean, Match recently, that's a name I know better, they, they recently sued Google for po some of the policies that are supposed to be changing here at the end of 22, I believe, or at some point in 23. Right. And I thought very interestingly, Google turned around and countersued them. And they wrote a blog piece where they came at them very directly, which I guess you can read it in two different ways. It's either kind of a defensive way of them doing that or them being comfortable in the position to basically say, we're going to do what we want to do. It's our app store. It's our rules. Um, yeah. I think it's probably more the latter. But the I was surprised to see them publicly put out something kind of fairly aggressive in terms of their commentary. The thing with this that makes it so tough from an antitrust perspective is that it's hard to prove that the consumer is being harmed. Yeah. Like if I'm buying things, if I'm spending money on the Match uh, app or, or on Tinder or I'm spending money on Fortnite or wherever else, I really don't give a shit. Yeah. What, what Apple's take rate is, how does that affect me? Unless some company comes along and can make the case that the product or service would be cheaper if it weren't for, and I'm sure that can be done. I don't think that anyone has been able to do it yet. No, I, again, I think the drumbeat around this was as loud as it could be during the Epic trial, and you were seeing politicians talk about it then, but it's completely faded away, but so, at, at least in the U.S. I think in Europe, it's a little bit different, but in the U.S., it's... Basically a non-issue. As somebody right. who has the majority of their uh, exposure to stocks and, and index funds, it's, it's something that I think about is how big can these companies get? Where are the next generation of winners? And I've been probably, I've probably said that when Apple was one and a half trillion dollars, but it's now 2.7. Right. And so where, like, are we going to be talking here uh, in five years when Apple's at like 7 trillion and, it, and we were like, I was worried at 2.5. Like, <laughs> you would think that at some point, there is an upper bound of how big these companies can get, but maybe not. You would think until you see Google in, or Alphabet in a difficult quarter from a macro perspective put up, and FX have wins, by the way, put up, you know, 13% revenue growth. Like all, all these players. They have, so many, <laughs> they have so many levers to pull. Yeah, they so just that continue when to one grow. part of the business is hurting, they can do something somewhere else and yeah. just deliver. Yeah. And these I mean, companies are machines. They just deliver. But so history would say that there is a lot of turnover at the top, right? The top yeah, 10 lists, there's, sure. there's a lot of turnover. Uh, at the risk of sounding like an idiot, is it different this time? I think that you can make a case that these names are so entrenched. And I know that you could have done that probably previously sure. with, with the IBMs and the, the energy names, but not to the extent that these names are just such a part of our life. And what disrupts Google? What disrupts Apple? Yeah, I mean, to the point, the quote you started with, I mean, cloud computing, in my mind, is is part of what that is. It's something that's a benefit to all corporations and society at large if it lives up to the— And the scale. The, we've never seen companies so, this big, so growing right. this quickly, this profitable, these margins. Right. It's never happened. So, right. I, so I guess I don't agree with the premise that they're undisruptable uh, forever because look at what's going on with Meta. It is being mm -hmm. disrupted in every facet of its business. But if we were talking about this two years ago— like you, you would have put them in the same category in terms of lock-in that you would now put Apple and Amazon. Like you would look at the stranglehold well, of Instagram pre-pandemic, pre-TikTok, and you TikTok before the mm -hmm. pandemic was called Musically. Right. And my kids lived on the app, and I looked it up. I'm like, who makes Musically? And it's it's like I don't know. It's a Chinese uh, intelligence black ops. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but like th so much has changed to the point where Meta has lost half its market cap. Fine. We're going to do a whole, we're going to do a whole thing on Meta later. So just put a pin in this for a second. Um, 
Alex, where do you think we are generally on earnings? I, th- I made the case that I think that we can say with the benefit of hindsight that the market got it wrong in terms of selling Apple off 29%, Amazon 45%, given that we now know that Apple had a record June quarter, that right. Google still was growing. Like, was the, what, where do you see, generally speaking, earnings? Outside of, outside of advertising, most of the names I've seen have been fairly strong. We were talking about Disney before we hopped on. They were talking about the parks and saying that the parks are doing very well and they see no sign of that changing. I mean, that's... A very expensive trip to take. I think this whole thing, I don't know that the market got it wrong, but for a different reason than you might think. I think it's a tale of two consumers. So when you watch business television or you read the Wall Street Journal or whatever, you hear about the consumer this, the consumer that. It's not one consumer. And actually, as good as Disney's parks business was, Six Flags was a shit show. Yeah. We're in the same business. (laughs) It's a different customer. Different demographic. Well, that's my point. So Apple caters to a customer that is not really going to materially change their lifestyle based on inflation. I'm sorry. I'm just telling you, like, that's the reality. Um, I bet you Android is not doing as well as Apple in whatever, you know, metric that you want to look at for that reason. So it's really tough to monolithically talk about the U.S. consumer as though everybody's living the same lifestyle. We know for for a fact that there is a component to the U.S. consumer. uh, There there is a a strata within the U.S. consumer where, you know, five, six dollar gallon of gas materially changes the way they live their lives. Yeah. But that's not most people. Sure. I mean, I mean, food inflation running in double digits means something a lot different for, uh, yeah, for for different people. It sucks that it is that way. So if you were looking at the data, the consumer slowdown, and you looked at Walmart mm-hmm. spitting the bit and being like, "Guys, it's bad," and then you said this will apply to Apple, then you don't know anything about the U.S. consumer yeah. because these are two different worlds. Well, and again, as we've seen in so many industries too, the the pandemic had a weird impact even on someone like Walmart, where you see the non-food categories had a fantastic two-year run. And, you know, some of this can just be overhang. If you buy TVs for your house... You don't need to keep doing that. You don't need more of them. And if they cut the price 10%, that might not change anything anyways, because if you just bought one 18 months ago... It doesn't matter how much you cut the price. When I say that markets were wrong, I mean investors were wrong. Investor expectations were clearly wrong, because look how people were positioned going into earnings season. Like, people... And this is this is mainly the reason why you're seeing stocks react the way they are, where you're seeing companies miss and still trade higher. Coinbase's report was dog shit, mm-hmm. and it's had a very nice run since. Why? People are offsides. People are way too bearish. Yeah. So this is this is the net percentage taking higher than normal risk levels. And it's a Bank of America Global Fund Manager survey. And we're literally, like, these people are as defensive as they've been since freaking Lehman blew up. The July, right, the July reading was as, was as risk off for global portfolio managers as October of 08 So people was. were not positioned, obviously, for softer inflation numbers, and they were definitely not positioned for earnings holding in the way that they did. And the theory that I have on this is that people were were saying that there was maybe a one-to-one correlation between inflation and consumer slowing down. And I think that the a lot of the Target Walmart inventory stuff really threw people off, yeah. and they read too much into that. I think I did. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe inflation is having a lagging impact because consumers, if we as we spoke about, going into the recession were so flush with cash that maybe inflation hits them on a lag and earnings don't soften up until maybe Q3, Q4. So we know we know what you just said is true. And consumers are also now willing to go back into more credit card debt uh, to keep their lifestyle now mm-hmm. that they've had a taste of it. People, it's very hard for people to downshift. And actually, Wells Fargo put out credit card data indicating that their customers are using their rewards points for everyday purchases like groceries and gas. Hmm. Wh- whereas like, I think during the pandemic, they were able to use those points for like something bigger, like a dishwasher or, some- mm-hmm. or something. Now they're just using it to get by. And that's like usually not a great sign. Mm-hmm. Um, credit card spending overall has now eclipsed the, pre-pan- the pre-pandemic high. So huh. we're like back to as though that never happened. So the consumer is more resilient than you think because they still have access to credit, which they haven't really had to use. Yeah. for a couple of years. Um, the other thing, though, that's happened, I don't want to give er- earnings season all of the credit for this market rebound. Look at look at w- what's gone on with the 10-year mm-hmm. and look at what's happened uh, to the price of gasoline. Right. In the last 60 days, we've seen gasoline prices, relatively speaking, collapse, and we've seen borrowing costs come back down. 30-year mortgage 
uh, just dropped. Like we're seeing refis again, again. <laughs> Where we thought maybe never see another refi again. They're back, and it didn't take long. So I think there's a really quick reaction where the consumer gets a little bit of relief at the pump and says, you know what? I think I will go back to Dairy Queen tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, is Airbnb an inflation hedge? Um, I guess it could be in theory, <laughs> given that they take a, a take rate off of the daily room rate. So I guess in theory. So what, it, so what did you what did you take out of their earnings report? My main t- one of my main takeaways on Airbnb is that as I look at all the companies that I follow, so many have either early on or now had a negative impact from the pandemic. And obviously they had a negative one very early on, but I think it's actually led the company to become better on the back end because they they were coming from a place where they had been private, obviously, for a very long time. Their funding was they, – they, they didn't live in the public markets. And then they went public and went through a ton of pain. And I think they had to basically start building a real business and get their cost structure – uh, you know, normalize basically and figure out things like marketing, whether or not they needed to spend money or if the brand was good enough. And they basically have learned that we don't need nearly the marketing spend that we had. And yeah, now on the back end, they're they're just seeing massive increases and in long term stays is in my you know, when people stay in an Airbnb for a week or a month or longer, that's a part of the business that is obviously very differentiated from a hotel as opposed to like a one or two night stay. That's Nobody stays in a hotel for a month. When you right, stay when exactly. you stay in a month at an Airbnb, can you negotiate different rates? Yeah. Okay. And you, you typically get- Because otherwise it'd be un- unaffordable, right? You're not going to pay- It's still very expensive, but yeah, you typically get like a 20% discount if you're going over 28 days, something like that. What's All right. So ha- so you, you follow Airbnb closely. Are you bullish overall on the story? Do you feel like it's got much, much more potential than we've seen so far? Yeah, I think. I, what has this stop done uh, in the last like like year to date? It's not been with great. all the technology yeah, stuff. It hasn't done hasn't done very well. Okay, why are you why are you bullish on the story? I think the long term growth potential for this business, particularly as a result of what's happened with long term stays, seven plus day stays are now half the business. That's and amazing. I, th- I think a lot of that is structural. We may see some correction, obviously, as behavior coming out of the p- pandemic may normalize a little bit. But I think they've found something that is again. It's it, there's no real competitor for it outside of VRBO. You're not you're not competing with the hotel room at that point. And I think Airbnb VRBO has, is Expedia. Uh, yeah. Do any of the hotels have competing services that are starting to scale? Not like extended stay or stuff like that. But they don't have they okay. Don't, they like, don't Mar- have like Marriott doesn't have a, a an Airbnb killer. Not anything sizable now. Okay, so I they have this to themselves. They just have Pretty to. Much. I mean, it's them and VRBO. VR Expedia doesn't break out any numbers basically. So. Okay, <laughs> I have never been bull. I have never so I have never been bullish on Airbnb. And the first time I heard about it in like 2011, I was like, who the <laughs> f- would let strangers stay in their house? I'm very bullish on Airbnb. I, I just never got it. So, so, I, so I remember when you when you wrote about Airbnb last quarter, you said that the opportunity set is more attractive now, but relative to the other attractive opportunities, it, it doesn't make the cut. But you wrote today, or when I, whenever I, you wrote this. Uh, at $115 per share, the company has a market cap of $80 billion with a business at $1.7 billion in trailing 12-month operating income. That implies a valuation of 45 to 50 times EBIT, which is obviously rich. But you made the point that even going out uh, a couple of years, if they continue to grow at they're at 20 uh, with with significant margin expansion mm-hmm. that they're still 25 times going yeah. out to 2026. But the point that I made to you earlier is that would this company ever be cheap? Like and if it is, you, that's when you don't want it. Yeah, it happens. I mean, it was it was at ninety bucks a couple of weeks ago, but go go pick a list of stocks that were, you know, significantly cheaper then than they are today. <laughs> Throw this chart up. Average daily rates. I want to ask you about this. So on the surface, it looks good, but is that even keeping up with the rate of inflation? This, uh, so saying, <laughs> explain to people what's in this chart. What are yeah, we looking so at? Yeah, so this just shows the cost of a, of a room night, basically. So one hundred and sixty-four dollars is the average daily, daily rate yeah. for all Airbnbs. Yep. Um, in Q two twenty twenty two. Yeah. And the last quarter of twenty twenty, for a comparison, it was one hundred and twenty eight. Well, twenty twenty doesn't count. And people were not really traveling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you no, go so back, it's grown. Is my point. If you go back to pre pandemic, it's up you know, basically 50 bucks. Hey, I want to ask you, night. I want to ask you about this. Um, companies having the ability to maybe manipulate their free cash flow or get, get cute with accounting. Uh-huh. Um, obviously the street was, was um, rewarding growth at all costs over the last few years, right? Like Silicon Valley, we're, don't worry, we'll subsidize, we'll subsidize, we got you back, just grow, 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 grow. Mm-hmm. And the CEO of Uber 
was telling, uh, I think there was an employee memo that leaked that, okay, the game has changed. Now we have to start showing free cash flow. They did, Lyft did, Airbnb did. Yeah. M- d- did, is this going to be easier or harder than investors think in terms of like turning the dials up and down to show the street what they want to see? Well, I think a lot of companies are going to drastically change what, the, I mean, we even hear it from the companies that we talked about that are doing very well, like Apple and Google and Microsoft. Even these guys in some ways are saying, we're going to make adjustments here, there to be more thoughtful about where we play. Other companies are just going to completely get out of markets, in my opinion, in order to, they have to satisfy that demand of their investors. We saw, like, we saw PayPal bottom out in the 60s or $70 per share or something. And they basically were like, all right, here's the deal. We've spent the last few years focused on building the user base. Right. Now we're going to change our focus entirely. They have 400 million users. They mm-hmm. don't have to. So now instead of that, pursuing growth at any cost, we're going to focus on better monetization of the users we have. Yeah. And I'm guessing the street liked it. Stock went yeah. up 30 points. Yeah. Spotify's so, a very similar story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Warner Brothers Discovery is a similar story. Okay. They're coming from a different angle. So, but ca- so like cash flow is cool again. They – Dave Zaslov, CEO of Warner Brothers Discovery, said on the call, I don't care what the subscriber number is anymore, where a year ago he was saying the primary goal is 200, 300, 400 million DSC So, so that's, like a meme. that's like a meme <laughs> that, that floats around through the economy. Which one? Just like the, the changeover from growth to, mm-hmm. to cash flow. And like all the CFOs, they, they hear it somewhere and they adopt it and they bring it to their CEO or the CEO – Co- goes to uh, goes to the Sun Valley conference, right, and comes home and is like, "Man, Bezos was talking about free cash flow, and everybody's into this now. Let's do this." But is, is that is it that simple? Yeah, and I, to back to our earlier discussion, it's you a know, vibe. The 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 big boys, the Apples and the Microsofts and Amazon. I mean, especially if they can buy other companies, which I I don't know how much leash they'll be given on that going forward, unless they're very small deals, but. They can just continue to play offense through this, or at least on a relative basis, more offense than everybody else who has to, again, they have to appease shareholders, especially companies with huge stock-based comp and everything else. They have to appease shareholders and do something to to get someone to want to own the company. But you basically. must love this because as a fundamental investor, there not every company is the same. Like Shopify is going through whatever they're going through. Spotify seem listen to Spotify's call and things seem to be never better there. I know it's not necessarily yeah. the case, but like there are companies and stocks are like not one and it's not just one blob anymore. Right. And I, I it is it's interesting to see how stock price and investor, I'm sure obviously the companies are directly communicating with the street and and hearing their concerns, but it's interesting to see how those things can push companies to at least tweak the way they approach stuff. Spotify very clearly did that. Even Facebook. I mean, Zuck came out on the Q1 call and said, we're not just going to grow the reality lab stuff in perpetuity. It has to have some connection to the operating income growth of the core business. And they're seeing that put to the test right now because obviously the core business is really hurting, particularly from uh, macro factors. But you know, companies have to, even in a situation like that, he felt the need, we have to do something because, again, we pay a lot of stock-based comp and our employees care what the stock price is. Oh, what did you think of what uh, Rich Barton did over at Zillow, like topping off uh, RSUs? Oh, I didn't see it, but uh, I, Zillow's so he, been- he basically made the case that it's much easier to keep and retain talent mm-hmm. as opposed to going out and hiring new ones. Yeah. And so given the destruction of the stock, I think, I don't know if it fell 90%, but it might as well have. Yeah. They're, they're topping off uh, and taking care of some, some key employees. So, so, so it's going to employees and just being like, all right, we're going to replace a lot of the value that you yeah. lost. Yeah. That's smart. Smart. Yeah. Smarter I mean, than trying to hire in this yeah. environment for uh, brand new people. I think you have to operate under the, the, under the principle that when these really bad times come around, companies are just going to – I mean, Google did it during the financial crisis, I believe. Other companies did. They're just going to do this, and you either accept that or you don't, basically. <laughs> not that I like it, but well, I think they're just going to do it. They not, have to. They basically. said this will dilute existing shareholders over the next few years by 2%. All right. I mean, big deal. Yeah. yeah. Smart, smart business. So um, I feel like the, the recession meme – really got very carried away on social media. And people that are very influential, like Elon Musk, basically like, I guarantee you were already in a recession. And uh, I think that got to a point where you saw a lot of like venture capital guys doing these like very performative tweet storms about how they're gonna be the last man standing and our founders are getting the message from us that we blah, 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 blah. Forget growth, survive. Right, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, by the way, I'm not like, I'm not, like mocking it at all. What the hell do I know? Um, I actually think that with interest rates going up, 
and economic growth 100% slowing, doesn't have to be a recession, to just say like, okay, maybe this isn't the best time for empire building um, and maybe there's not going to be unlimited capital that you can raise. Okay, so that makes sense. And then it goes all the way up to the top to the point where S&P 500 CEOs are feeling and acting the same way, which leads me to uh, the concept of a vibe session. So it's not quite a recession technically. Like obviously nobody would look at um, nobody would look at employment data and conclude that this is like a recession, but it's a vibe session in the sense that people feel like it's worse than it is. What do you think? So yeah. we're gonna give um, <laughs> we're gonna give Kyla uh, Scanlon credit for her very con- I, I don't know if it's controversial her very notable op ed in the New York Times um, talking about this concept and people went nuts. And some people were like, how dare you call it a vibe session? My grocery bill, blah, blah, blah. All right, right. fine. We all we all get that. Right. But I really think there's a lot to this also, and I think she's right. I think we could talk ourselves into a recession with a vibe session. What yeah. do you think about that? I, I think it makes sense, and it's funny. You, you, see that, you see that on one side, and then on the other side, you see people saying, like, I went to you know, Vegas or XYZ place, and people are spending like there's no end in sight. I mean, and you see it in the company's numbers, too, so – Depending on the industry, I was just talking with my friend who went to Vegas, and he said he was speaking for one of the CFOs of the company. He's like, I don't understand what the street says. <laughs> like, look at my numbers, look at my parking lot. Right. Like, we've never been busier. Right. This is Kyla in the Times. Economic indicators are a Jackson Pollock painting of data points and trends. <laughs> if you think hard enough about all of them, they begin to make a bit of sense. But there's a lot to interpret. Economists have baseline theories about what the economy should do. But a pandemic, a war, and supply chain woes have widened the gap between the, quote, reality of economic data and people's experiences of that reality. Um, So I think that's right. And then you throw in the political angle. There are some people who are highly motivated to convince everyone around them that we're in a recession for a partisan reason because it's a, a midterm year. Sure. So nobody should be surprised that when you get too two contracting quarters of GDP that people are going to seize on that and use it to tell a bigger story. But then I saw this guy on Squawk Box this morning. He's a pollster, Frank Luntz. Uh-huh. Did you see this? I didn't see it, but I, I know who he is, or I know the name. I mean, no offense, but <laughs> this guy's whole sp- – and Andy Ross Sorkin was, like, cornering him. Like, he's like, how could you look at this data and say people aren't spending money? And his answer was, oh, no, they're spending money but they're not buying the things they want. They're buying like things that they don't really want that much. And I was just watching this like, dude, try, <laughs> don't try that hard. Don't bend yourself into pretzels. It's not a recession. The consumer is not behaving as though it's a recession. There are some companies telling us that consumers are trading up. You know what f-ing Disney said? They said we have less guests, but we have so many guests that there are some days that are totally sold out. Yeah. And the guests who are coming are spending more than ever. Yeah. So what are you literally talking about? Yeah, per caps are up 40% from 2019. That's, That's crazy. Per guest spending at right. the park. So I, th- I actually think spending might be slightly down from 19, but to your point, spending per guest, per guest is yeah. ludicrous. By the way, that's the best inflation edge. Maybe not the stock, but Disney <laughs> Disney parks are. The other thing is that we're, the, the, the layoffs that you're seeing are from brand name companies. And so you just see a headline, uh, Robinhood, Coinbase, Netflix, like it's just Tesla. It's just one after the other. Google, Apple slowing hiring. Yeah. And so you take all these little like anecdata points and you say like, okay, see? Yeah. yeah right. I mean, a lot of those tech companies have hired a ton of people over the past handful of years. Too. Yeah, that's, right. more, of that's, a cor- that's more of a corrective back to a normal. Yeah. Like Amazon added a million workers in a year. Right. That, what did you think? They were going to do that again? I saw yeah. somebody tweet like uh, tech CEOs in 2021 were hiring like crazy. Tech CEOs in 2022, we hired like crazy. <laughs> Here's the chief yeah. economist at LPL talking about the last jobs report. So the economy added 528,000 payroll jobs in July. Very recessionary. Again, very, very recessionary. <laughs> Uh, but this this is his comment. Firms ramped up production and increased manufacturing payrolls by roughly 30,000 in July. So for every 500 people laid off from Netflix, here's 30,000 <laughs> added to actual work. Uh, yeah. New jobs in manufacturing are likely due to improved supply chains, and this sector should continue to add jobs as remaining supply bottlenecks improve. Total employment has now returned to pre-pandemic levels in February 2020, but not to pre-pandemic trends. Um, the one negative is the participation rate 
dropped slightly, but okay, we have a lot of boomers. You can't, but there can't be a recession with 4% unemployment. Yeah, so, sorry, that's it. Look at look at Costco, Target, but wait a Chipotle. They all have raised so, wages significantly. So too. we have added back, this is the, the big picture. We've added back 22 million jobs in 18 months. It's insane. Yeah. It's insane. So we might have a recession, but to say that we're in one now, I mean, you re- yeah, we might have one. Might have one. Should have one at some point. Uh, what are we looking at here? Oh, you tell this me. This is broad-based <laughs> job gains in July. Surprise to the upside. Uh, change in pay. Yeah, I mean, not just the change in payrolls, but now look at the uh, look at the three-month moving average. Look at the six-month moving average. This this is stable. Is that a head and shoulders? No, but it's stable. <laughs> The moving average is it's stability. It's not it's not really going anywhere. So it threatened to for a moment, but it didn't hey, it didn't end up. Alex, uh, before we get to some of the streaming stuff, uh, which to me has been like the most exciting topic uh to follow of the year, how would you describe your style of investing? Uh I, I, I tend to focus on company reckless, the, <laughs> reckless just completely yes. wild eyed throw darts, <laughs> the easy of <laughs> stock pickers. No, I really focus on business <laughs> quality above all else. And, and at, over time I've, I've married that kind of with management quality as well. Cause the distinction for me really falls apart because I tend to be long-term and concentrated. So again, the management team strategic decision-making just becomes part of business quality over time, but it's really finding 10, 15 names that I really want to own for the long term. Like I've, at Berkshire and Microsoft, my largest positions, I've owned them since 2011. How do you avoid long term like the pitfalls of something like a GE where that was the most vaunted management strategy in the whole world? They yeah. wrote book, many, many books, leather bound books about yes. that, ma- that man. And it ended up that actually the company was so mismanaged that it became one of the biggest wrecking balls in American corporate history. So how do you how do you avoid that pitfall? Yeah, well, for one, I try to stay with things that I understand and that I can uh, can can really you know nail the kind of drivers of the business over time. So like, it's like very consumer focused tech media stuff that you can yeah. see. Why is this company growing? Why yeah. why do they deserve to make more money five ten years from now? Something like GE. I I mean I've gone back and for example I looked at Countrywide the 10K for 2006 one time just to see what it was. And I, reading it in hindsight, I was like, I still wouldn't have known that there were problems here. I just can't, I can't okay. understand a lot of what's being written here. So I try to avoid things like that to, okay. the, to the best of my abilities. And then, you know, I've, I've really had trouble in the past or a handful of my ideas that haven't worked have been ideas where the company was kind of losing relevance in terms of what consumers cared about. And you can make a case maybe on valuation or something like that. But I've learned, I just got hurt in names like that. IBM, I got into J.C. Penney around the same time as Bill Ackman, Kraft Heinz, names that if you step back and looked at where they were positioned relative to kind of competitors or emerging competitors, it was very obvious even at the time of the investment that they were losing some of their relevance. Okay. So I really try to avoid those things now. So, But how do you like measure that so that you can avoid it? It's, uh, I'm guessing it's not quantitative. Like it's got to be a feel thing. Well, it could be something. So I own Meta, for example, and it might be an example of breaking this rule, something like TikTok becoming clearly a much more relevant player now. Facebook's daily active users continues to grow and the family daily active users continue to grow. So I think there's allegedly, allegedly it could all be a lie. And (laughs) um, so I think there's, you know, there's, there's evidence on both sides in that situation, but it could be an example. The jury's not out there. Yeah. I don't think. So we're going to, we're going to get all into meta. The thing, the thing that I find especially fascinating about the streaming war is how wall street can influence business because one of the big things that the market prized and valued highly was recurring revenue, Mm -hmm. right? And that is subscription services, that is streaming. And so that's the game that everybody was playing was let's catch up to Netflix, right? Always trading at a ludicrous multiple. And then uh, the wheels fell off, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so, so we're at this interesting place where everybody was chasing them. Now they're sort of chasing it. So, so streaming is, is doing poorly. Cable is doing poorly, what the hell is the what is the state of streaming right now? Because it's it's just it's a lot. Yeah, the state of streaming is uh, six months ago. Netflix came out and said subscriber growth is has completely changed from the trends that we saw previously. Went I mean, negative. Yeah, went negative, and you know before they were adding on a trailing two month basis or two year basis, they were adding you know mid fifty million subscribers a year <sighs> leading up to the pandemic, and now they're coming out and saying it might not grow much from here essentially. So that was kind of the first major, the start of the reset. Subsequently, other companies have come out. I mean, Disney is one kind of exception, but they've also had their own headwinds. But 
the other companies have come out and said our results are not that good. The difference between them and Netflix is Netflix has built up a thirty billion dollar you know run rate business and margins have improved over time. They have a path to make this actually work. For a lot of the subscale players, the path who to are, make that who, happen. What are the subscale stocks in this space? Paramount, Paramount, who else? NBC Universal, which is part of Comcast. Warner it's amazing Brothers. that NBC all these is stocks, subscale. <laughs> all these stocks yeah. suck. In D2C, they are at least. Right? Yeah. Uh, WBD is on. Is that s- Warner Brothers? Subs- yeah, Warner Brothers Discovery is. I'd still say it's subscale person in terms of global. That's, but that's HBO. D2C. Yeah. Okay. Which is basically a U.S. brand. Or I would say, right, I would and say. And what the hell are they doing? What is their story? They're, they're merging. <laughs> they're going to get, are they going to get rid of the HBO name? Uh, HBO, it sounds like HBO is going to basically become a part of whatever service they yeah. have. So it'll be a tab. We'll or, never get rid of that name. Yeah. So they'll start the name, so but it won't be the name of the service. It sounds like that's the but direction they're, they're Okay. It just yeah. basically becomes a studio. Yeah. Uh, like, just like uh, Disney's not going to get rid of Marvel just because they own it. Right. Like you have that, uh, you have that brand. Yeah. The brand has value to the consumer. You don't get rid of it, it that quickly. It could be within the app or whatever. Okay. But, yeah. but, but these are some of the worst performing stocks in the market. Comcast, Warner Brothers, yeah. uh, Paramount, all of them. Yeah. I mean, Warner Brothers, they, they came together last year with Discovery Discovery, and, and Warner from AT&T, which AT&T, my understanding of what they wanted was they wanted a bunch of cash to help pay off debt as opposed to just having a massive equity slug in the combined company. So – this new company got saddled with fifty billion plus of debt, and they're going through. Wait, a tra- they put the debt on the streamer? Yeah, yeah, because AT and T wanted cash. They, I mean, they still got equity as well, but the Warner piece of this combination was so much bigger than a Discovery piece. That what's so funny is that AT and T itself is such a shit show. The <laughs> stock price, so it's not even like it helped them. Right. And how bad? How bad was the movie Batgirl? Honestly, it was probably. And I like bad movies. Yeah. This was probably unwatchable. I mean, it's getting trashed. I mean, no one's going to see it now. But <laughs> I actually, I saw a rough cut of it. Oh and, yeah, how was uh, it? Yeah, no, I think they should have released it. But so it's just again, the opening scene is Batgirl stop. goes into a <laughs> kindergarten class. Uh. And starts having like this very heated conversation about gender with the kids. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Duncan cut and that. And then it gets way better from there. <laughs> so don't you dare cut these, it. These kids just <laughs> doubled over laughing. These what? these the cable companies are in secular decline, right? People are cutting the cord. Yeah, pay TVs. I mean, in my opinion, pay TVs in secular decline, and it's become worse in the past six months. And, and so it is just interesting that those stocks suck. They are in secular decline. And on the other hand, like the winners, which are the streamers, are getting the shit kicked out of them too. Yeah, I mean, people are trying to figure out what this business actually looks like on the other side. And the question is partly, are you going to be a global company or are you going to be a regional company? You know, Warner Brothers, they have a reasonably good U.S. business in terms of direct-to-consumer. It's international where they don't really have the pieces. And it's partly because of HBO's prior strategy where they license so much content. The brand doesn't mean the same thing internationally that it does here. Mm. Do you own any of these? I own Netflix and Disney. Um, so, But anyway, so they they – got together with Discovery, which has an international portfolio. The only problem is a lot of the content is like filler that, you know, it's HGTV and Discovery Channel and things like that. And it's when they were a standalone it's like two company, guys in a junkyard. Yes. Uh, Storage Wars. Look, looking for a, a grandfather clock to restore. Right. And there are people that will watch that if they like are switching channels on a television. Right. But probably aren't subscribing to a streaming service. Right. Because that exists on But the so platform. when are we going to find out whether or not Netflix's uh, ad experimentation is going to work? Because they're going to face that in very, very First slowly. Quarter. Right. They're going to start, uh, maybe, I think, in South America, they said. and But it, so this could take multiple, multiple quarters. They said Q1. Yeah. I mean, for this to, time be, to be rolled out yeah. in a big way and for us to see, I mean, a big question is going to be how well can this thing monetize? Well, let me ask I'm you, optimistic let me ask, on that front. Let me I ask imagine, you about that. You must be optimistic given that you own the stock. Here's what I think is interesting. If you look at any legacy, or any of the legacy media companies that has an ad supported tier and a, a, just a subscription tier, they all across the board say that the ad supported tier, the ARPU from that advertising piece makes that a higher ARPU offering than the premium tier. Does it does it cannibalize the premium tier though? It could, but I guess part of the question would be no. do you, do you no. care at that point? I don't think I don't okay. think people are going to switch down. Do you find it interesting that they went to Microsoft as their partner to build the ads out and considering that Microsoft is who Facebook went to in 07 when they needed an ad strategy. They had no uh-huh. revenue. They was, went that, to, was that before or after? Because Microsoft eventually invested in Facebook. That, well, that's so. how they got. No, they didn't. They were given equity. Oh, okay. As part of. I gotcha. So Zucker, Zuckerberg went to Microsoft or ultimately chose Microsoft. Uh huh. Help us build out an ad platform. Yeah. 
and they did, and the rest is history. It became one of the most successful ad platforms of all time. Uh-huh. That's who Netflix chose. Yeah. I doubt it's the same people, but uh-huh. uh, I found that really interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of connection between those two companies going back as well. So I, I think it, I think it's a pretty sensible partner for them. And Just big picture. Like, is Reed Hastings not going to do this? No, he's so gonna, what? He's gonna of course it. he's going to do this. <laughs> I mean, that yeah. might be naive, but that's just how I feel. Let's look, yeah. at, let's look at some of these charts. I mean, this this Warner Media directed to consumer trail on twelve month profitability. This is this is this this is savage. That's this what, is, this I mean, is, that's what but, happens. But this is on purpose. That's, See, that's yeah, the exactly. thing. Look, look when this chart starts, Mike. Q three twenty twenty. The mindset in the Nasdaq is still growth at any growth at any cost. Do whatever you have to do. Build the subs. Right. Yeah. So that's why they're spending like this. That it's, was the strategy they were pursuing. That they that, said they were going to do it. It's effectively done now to a certain extent. The new management team has said that's we're not doing this anymore. They said we're going to make so many new episodes of this Sex in the City horror show, <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna spend unlimited amounts of money to continue to make Sex in the City. <laughs> but so and one of the did. things that you keep talking about, and John, next chart, please, is just that, real quick though yeah, on, that, on that point. Disney, the successful the successful entrant in the space, everybody basically agrees with that. Since the start of 2020, their D 2 C business has lost seven billion dollars. Success here is years of significant losses. They just said they're going to build a base. They just said they're going to cut. To be willing to do, they're going to cut spending from 32 billion to 30 billion. Yeah, think about these numbers. Yeah, like, and they said more important. The next handful of years are probably going to stay in that ballpark. So now you have both Netflix and Disney saying we're going to we're going to stay. Can we here stay for on a this. Bit. Can we stay on this? So okay, so they're they're both going to spend. Netflix and Disney, full speed ahead. Yeah. Still now you a lot have, of money. <laughs> okay. Now you have Amazon Prime yeah. is going to start writing billion dollar checks to the NFL. Well, and Lord and, of the Rings. And, and you have Apple, who's it's at getting better. Any, at any moment, Apple could just decide to drop a, a huge spending blitz, a bomb on Hollywood yeah. anytime it feels like it. Yeah. So, how could you be subscale? In an environment where the average consumer is going to have how many of these things? So who's that? Like Ford? Peacock? Yeah, I mean those people they won't they won't stick around. Paramount Plus answer. they they won't be services. Well, can any of them get bought? Why wouldn't Apple just just <laughs> buy one of these things? Well, I want. I mean, I think Microsoft ATVI is an interesting case of whether or not stuff like this is going to be allowed to be done. Any, I mean, is is Apple going to be allowed to go buy any company for twenty billion dollars? I think it, Apple will get away with it because they're not acquisitive. Business. I don't so, think I don't think um, Alphabet could. I'm yeah. pr- or or Amazon. I'm pretty yeah, sure Apple so, could. Yeah. What's Disney Hulu going to look like in a year or two? Uh, well, they have to resolve the fact that Comcast still owns a third of Hulu. But once they do that, I think they eventually collapse Hulu into kind of a Disney app base. I mean, they have the bundle now, which effectively works okay. But I think they need to integrate it. I think, more but than these services currently. are getting better. Like Apple's yeah. getting significantly better. Yeah, I agree Hulu, with that. Hulu's getting significantly better. Yeah. Like the content is getting better. But the next chart shows that Netflix is still the king. Let me yeah. see. Like, oh, wow. By double. Yeah. What it, is this? This is rev- streaming revenues. Yeah, run Netflix rate, is re- still twice as big as Disney. Run rate annual revenues. Netflix is twice as big as Disney, basically, and bigger than all three of them combined. Uh, Just slightly bigger. Netflix is so big. <laughs> yeah. And it's so international. Yeah. They've done such a great job in so many countries in a way that, like, I think would be, even be a challenge for Disney. Back to the previous point about WBD and their international problems, their their international run rate revenues now are basically one point seven billion dollars a year. Netflix International That's nothing, is seven, right? seventeen billion. Yeah. Oh so my god. As they as they to go global for them is just such a massive challenge. And if they had a decent balance sheet, it would be a massive challenge. And then their Netflix repurposing global content for the US market has been an absolute home run. Yeah. One I mean, that nobody thought was possible so this chart to me is like uh index funds it's just like a one-way secular rise taking stream we're looking at the share of u.s times tv streaming right now it's at about 30 percent. this is going to get to 50 percent eventually do you do you disagree hold on no, it'll this get is there. share of u.s tv time for streaming, streaming services, services as a percentage of the so total tv time on the surface it hasn't grown that much but this only goes back to may 21 yeah nielsen just started but look it went from, but but just since then it went from 25 to 30 to 35 almost Thirty—that's th- a lot. It's, it's massive. A th- it's a third of TV time. Is so a, Netflix, a Netflix in, in in May was six point eight percent of all hours on TV was based on Netflix. In the in June it was seven point seven percent. That's a huge increase. Yeah, Stranger Things. Right, okay, there <laughs> they're it is. Main t- but Netflix is maintaining this six seven percent yeah. share of the total pie, like yeah. pretty consistently as the pie is growing. As the overall pie is growing, and this is their most competitive market by far. So 
Uh, if you want to reason, what is be, the United States? Yeah, if right. you want to reason, be bullish Netflix. This is a pretty compelling chart right here. <laughs> They've managed to hold their own in in the most difficult period, competitive wise, and that competitiveness is going to start going. But the so there's got to be consumer fatigue because even on my TV, and I subscribe to a lot of them, it's like click, 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 click. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's part of their problem, right? They have to figure out how to obviously make a lot of really good shows, but then also to surface them and get people to watch. Well, right? the consumer is winning because there is just a ton of good content. Yeah. But the old content still works too, which is so remarkable about streaming. Mm -hmm. um, like there are people starting Game of Thrones for the first time. Yeah. There are people starting Breaking Bad for the first time. Mm -hmm. These were expensive shows to make, but the, the tale is so long for all of that stuff. Yeah, in certain cases, those shows can hold on, which is obviously- Hey, let me important. ask you how, how terrible on the scale of one to 10 <laughs> 10 being incredibly terrible is the new Game of Thrones going to be. I was not a huge fan of the first one at the end, at least. So uh, I'll, you don't I'll say it's going to be, be pretty bad. <laughs> I, I never watched it. What? <laughs> what am I doing here? I watched it. John, how bad is this? Uh, what is it called? Dragon? Dragon there. Love? House of the Dragon. I think. House of the Dragon? I think. It yeah. looks it looks horrible, right? Yeah, not excited. This could be this could be. This could be deathly for WBD <laughs> stock. Yeah. That would oh, not if this be thing good. flops on arrival, that would not be good. It could be very bad for that stock. So, if this is not, uh, if there's not enough choices, what the hell is Walmart doing now? <laughs> so, Walmart's trying to basically find their their path to Amazon Prime. Oh, my God. And, Stop. Uh, yeah. It should just be closed circuit uh, television of Walmart cash <laughs> registers. That should be the whole streaming service. Just yeah. brawls in Walmart. Well, it's not going to get watched very much. So, they might as well do that. <laughs> well, what would they really do to differentiate themselves? They've toyed with this stuff in the past, and they never found a way to do it. Partly because there probably isn't a logical. How way about to just do like it. one show? It's just Dukes of Hazard, but it's yeah. every season. <laughs> and I don't know what else, what what could Walmart do that everyone else isn't doing? I mean, they'll probably do just agreements. charge less. They'll just do agreements like the wireless companies do, where you get a service for free or at a very discounted rate or whatever. But they shouldn't do anything on their own. Again, they've toyed with this stuff in the past, and it's. It's not where they should be focused. I'm only attention. watching uh, CVS <laughs> uh, streaming content hey, this, right this now. This is a dumb question. So. How do how do cable companies like grow their subscriber base? Is this just like household formation thing? Cable what? meaning like internet or it, like just like the cable, like Comcast, getting yeah. new people to subscribe. A lot of household formation and then taking share in the markets that they compete in, which is part of the problem right now. They say mover churn is down significantly and household formation is down, and we typically, when someone moves or goes to you know buy a new house, we win a larger percentage of those new opportunities than we have in our base. So we gain share and we grow our customers, but people aren't moving like they were before. So it's, it's an impact to their business. Let me ask you this. So Ben Carlson is famous for every year he claims that he negotiates a lower price on his cable bill. I don't buy it, but that's what oh, he says. Sprinkles does. <laughs> that's what he says. I no, don't, we do. Okay. I don't believe you either. We get free. No, it's not a lower rate. More free shit. Okay. Because <laughs> I tried last year and- uh, you're, I not, you're not, you're not, you're no Ben Carlson. I failed <laughs> miserably. And here's my, th my thesis is that people in, in the Midwest are nice. And so most people in the Midwest like <laughs> don't try and renegotiate. Whereas New York is full of assholes and like 80% of the customer base is calling a threat and quit. I said, I will leave. I Wait, will who's leave. Your, who's your cable and service they provider? they said, sir, you're free to leave. Uh, oh, wow. Verizon. Uh, who's Ben's? Charter? Who's in the I don't, middle? I don't know. Some, some Midwestern sleepy little cable <laughs> it's, outfit. It's like a mom and pop shop. He says, he says yeah, it's uh, Ben. Very confident in my assertion. <laughs> and I am not happy with my price. And they so said- So what do you get? I, how, do, how do I haggle? You just ask for free shit? Yeah, I called up. I learned this by accident. I called up like five years ago and I'm like, I have like nine boxes in my house. I have a box. In, I have a cable box in my garage. I'm just like, listen, I don't even know what I'm paying you for or why, but can you just throw in Red Zone? He's like, I'm not sure about that. I'm like, all right, I'm going to start canceling some of these boxes. I'll list them. You you shut them off. He's like, ah, wait, wait, <laughs> hang on. We do have uh, a promotion. Uh, we have a promotion, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm not paying a less amount, but I do that. Shari does that every year. We just keep I want, getting more you know, free I want stuff. free Chipotle for a month. Can they throw no, a free got, Chipotle? No, but listen, I'm not even joking. We got like better. We got the better broadband, like the top level. We just call every year and make demands. And like they, the guy answering the phone doesn't give a shit. Like he's just trying to clock out. So I feel like if you, maybe you should have Ben call for you. Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> have Ben call for everybody. Very confident in my assertion. Shout out to Ben. All right. Uh, so what are we doing with this chart here? What are we doing with this total broadband customers? This doesn't look like anything's happening with it. Oh, it's up and to the right. It's up and to the right. Um, yeah, they both have about 30 million customers now throughout the U.S. So they are 
very significant players. But obviously. so why, why, why? <laughs> oh, because here's one thing that people don't understand though. Hold on. You call up and you go, I don't want any channels. I just want broadband. Uh -huh. And they go, yeah, but it's cheaper to get the broadband if you buy the package with the channels. So that's what's going on. Yeah. They're making you take the channels by underpricing the broadband. Yeah. Because if you're 23 years old, graduate college, get your first apartment in this economy, and you call up and you're like, listen, I just want Wi-Fi for my apartment. I don't need anything else. They're like, yeah, but take the channels. Yeah. And we'll make it, you know, we'll we'll make it less, somehow we'll like make it a better deal for you. But so why are these comp why do these stocks suck? Are they just are they just killing each other? I mean, part of the part of the worries that people have is about competition over time with with fiber and now fixed wireless is another concern. So I read your piece today. So what's going on? So team, so like the wireless companies are getting into this now. Yeah, T-Mobile is offering fixed wireless, which is basically what's fixed wireless. View it as your home internet product, okay. but it's it's a wireless offering. So you could use your computer. Is it as TV. good as cable broadband, or is it good enough? Depending where you're at, it's probably good enough. But it if if you listen to someone like AT and T, they say this doesn't have the ability technologically to to keep up with fiber or you know a real Internet That's how you know it does, time. though. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. Right. <laughs> but can you watch 4K? Can you watch 4K video on fixed broadband? Yeah, I don't. I you'd have to try it out, I guess. And it depending, obviously, in your rural areas, you might not be able to anyway. So it could be, you know, a competitive offering in certain markets where they're going to. Um, people are concerned whether or not this will be a, a competitor for that thirty million dollar or thirty million, uh, you know, broadband base that Comcast and Charter both have. And I think T-Mobile is going to because of the T-Mobile Sprint merger. They had a lot of excess capacity on their network, basically, and this is one way to use it where, you know, kind of the way they frame it, we're not even really paying for it because we already have this capacity. But at some point that runs out, and then you do need to pay for the incremental capacity to justify doing this. And a home broadband customer uses so much more data than a mobile customer that the price on a, you know, a unit basis is significantly different. And they'll probably eventually, you know, some version of like throttling the home internet customer to to prioritize the wireless people because they pay them so much more money. So mm. I think that's probably where this goes over time, but it is a relevant product for a certain type of customer. So why do you own these? When you say you own these names through Liberty, what does that mean? So Liberty Broadband owns a decent chunk of charter. Got it. They own a decent chunk of a lot of things. Yes. Right. <laughs> uh, I want to go right to Meta with you. Sure. Let's do it. I I'm like so bearish on this name, <laughs> but I'm willing to have my, I don't have a position and I don't short stocks. Alex is long. Yeah. Uh, no, I know. So I would love for you to like maybe change my mind because sure. it is because in the end it is a stock that's fifty percent off its off its high. Yeah. So I would love to be wrong and for there to be an opportunity here. Sure. Um, but I want to start off by just uh, sharing something with you that I think probably doesn't matter right now, but I think is very relevant for a long term. Where do you get the data, Frank Luntz? Frank Luntz provided. <laughs> no, this is Pew Research, so you know it's good. <laughs> Um, this is a survey of U.S. teens, 1,316 U.S. teens between the ages of 13 and 17. I don't know how they get to these people. It must be super <laughs> creepy. Yeah. Um, they probably have to do the poll in the form of a TikTok. Anyway, according to Pew, only 32% of teens say they use Meta's Facebook app. So that's high. I would have thought even lower. Yeah. Um, too. but that's a decline from 71% who said they used the app in a survey they did in 2015. So in seven years, they've lost half of the amount of teens who are willing to admit that they are using um, Facebook. And well, there's no competition by 2015. So for comparison, YouTube is 95% of teens say they use it, obviously. Um, worse for Meta is 67% of teens report using TikTok. And I actually bet that number's low. Um, and we know that they have just tried to turn Instagram into TikTok and there was a huge backlash and it's just not really going to happen that way. Uh, they tried to shove all this content down your throat of people you don't follow. Right. And they tried to orient the whole thing toward vertical video and it just – people were grossed out. Anyway, uh, in Q4, Facebook lost daily active users quarter over quarter for the first time in history. Um, probably tough to turn that ship around. 62% of teens say they use Instagram, which is 5% fewer than say they use TikTok. Um, so there are, they are losing ground in a lot of ways. And then if you look at like the usage, the growth of usage, um, there's a 5% difference between TikTok and Instagram use, which doesn't seem huge. But the survey also said 
Instagram usage among teens only rose 10% since 2015. Usage of Snapchat rose 41%, uh, rose from 41% to 59% in that same time. So they're like losing ground to pretty much everybody. Um, that being said, why should I buy the stock? Yeah, I think it's important to frame. I, I think there's definitely truth to that statement. I think it's for U.S. consumers and probably teens most likely. As that one chart was just showing there. John, throw the pack. The U.S. is obviously an important part of their business, particularly in terms of, of, right. of the ARPU that they the, generate. It's not the whole thing. But it's not the whole business. And a big part of this is, you know, thinking Wait, about- Wait, hold on, hold on. So Facebook has 197 million active U.S. users. Yeah. Uh, but- And this doesn't, daily. Include in, this doesn't include Instagram. But they have 836 million in Asia and uh, yeah. 300 million in Europe. And then another 600, where- Hey, Where wait the a other minute. Place, Rest of the world. Hey, wait a minute. I don't know. How many, how, many, how many people in the world are connected to the internet? Uh, a lot, I guess. They have like all of them? <laughs> they have they all have, of they them. They have 2 billion daily active users? But you know what Facebook considers an active user? You could be on well, any so website. What? If you're logged in via Facebook, they're counting you. Okay. No, not so what. If you're not even using Facebook, but they're counting you as active because you had logged into that site before. Wait, wait. What do you mean? Exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> Let's say you know how there are sites where it's e-commerce, but you could log in through your Facebook account or um, whatever. Oh, okay. So they're like counting you as an active user, but you're not sitting there looking at Facebook. Mm. Um, well, sixty-three right? percent of the no. world yeah, I mean, has I mean, internet. If, if there's the thing at the bottom where you can comment or things like that, or see, they probably do count that. What's da- what's this next? What's this daily active people chart? What does that mean? Wait, wait. So wait, I was getting I was getting convinced on the stock. Go on. <laughs> so it's global. I got so that. That first chart was Facebook and uh, uh, Messenger. Or yeah, whatever the service is called, family daily active people includes all of the services. Oh, that so in, okay, has, so Instagram and it's deduplicated. It's such so a you, huge number. Yeah, so two point eight eight billion people globally use one of these services on a daily basis. Which is again, wh- WhatsApp, Instagram, Meta, uh, uh, yeah. uh, Facebook, whatever the what floor. else? I'm Oculus. Right now. Yeah, fa- WhatsApp. Did you say WhatsApp? Yeah. Okay. But I mean, you can see from from two years ago, it's up. 400, yeah. It's up 400 million people. How many people are on Earth? <laughs> Seven billion? Seven. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm like saying. So How many- to answer your question, it's like half. <laughs> half the Earth is, in some way, shape, or form, somebody's using one of their apps. Yeah, 2.88 billion people. Very impressive. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think we, come to, we sometimes paint these things through a U.S. lens and right. obviously teens, and we all see what's happening. And I think, you know, I saw a great chart a couple of years ago that basically asked, or a poll, it asked people, basically what is Facebook and the percentages outside the U S of people saying that Facebook is the internet. There were countries where it's over 50% and it's, that's where they start. That's like their portal to the internet. Yes. Yeah. I understand that. So, and again, there's, there's an ARPU chart as well that shows their monetization and and how it's grown very significantly over time. Would you agree that they have probably stretched to the limit of ad load on their feeds? Can they conceivably put more ads on? I mean, it depends if they can build out new formats like they're trying to do with Reels. And you uh, know, what, whether, So what is this? This shows ad impressions and then the price per ad um, just on a quarterly basis. And neither of these are particularly great charts. No, I mean, but look at ad impressions over – I mean, obviously, if people think engagement is imploding, you somehow have to get ad impressions, which means there's enga- – unless you're just but stuffing I think they're the feed stuffing. with ads, which they could be. They could be adding more and more and more, but that would eventually hit a breaking point. Why is the price per ad plunging? Uh, because they're introducing new formats and they have to basically prove out – like okay. reels and things like that. They have to prove out to advertisers. So they have to sell it to work. an advertiser for less until the advertiser Somebody actually to, sees it work. And if nobody's bidding for it, then the price is What's just your impression of how reels is going so far? I think it's gone reasonably well, but to your point, there has been some backlash and they have, you know, to some extent just forced it on people. And I think they'll they'll continue to do that to some extent because- they, Until people stop complaining. They think this is the future. And they, yeah. they really are investing heavily into this AI generated content or, you know, AI selected content essentially- being part of your feed. So they just did it too fast. They Probably. didn't give you a chance to like warm up to it. Yeah. I don't actually mind them suggesting things into my feed because I hate my friends anyway. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's perfectly fine. Yeah. I, I they hate have to do it well. I hate the strangers, <laughs> but I hate my friends. So you could put whatever you want there, I think is what I'm let's, saying. John, let's look at the financials. So Alex, you wrote in Q2, Meta's family of app revenues declined 1%. It was up 3% in constant currencies, obviously the stronger dollar hurt. You said that this result was primarily attributable to a 5% decline in average revenue per person across the family of apps, which is offset by a 4% year-over-year increase in daily active people across the apps. What was really interesting to me is revenues are down like a lot. 
Uh, they were $33.6 billion in Q4, and they were $28.2 billion in Q2. And I imagine that's not like a seasonality thing. It's just they, they're, they haven't, they're not growing. There is some seasonality from just these shops that are using okay, Facebook so, yeah, ads okay. in order to sell stuff during the holidays. Right. But, but yeah, I mean, you can see year over year. It's but basically still, flat, year, yeah, year, yeah, year over year it's down. This is for a business that had you know, consistently reported 20 30 40% revenue growth. So I'm, it's a huge change in trend. This um, next table shows it. Let's see. Uh, okay, so Alex broke out the quarterly revenue gro growth over the last four quarters between Meta, YouTube, Roku, Snap, and Twitter. And forget Twitter because that's just a bag of shit. <laughs> YouTube's up five. YouTube five percent. Roku eighteen percent. Snap thirteen percent. This is the most recent quarter. And Meta negative one. Yeah, I mean, but look at the deceleration on some of these other names. The point was simply to show this is not just a Meta issue. Oh, they're, they're right. Okay, Snap fine. Snap has gone from thirty eight percent growth to thirteen percent right. growth. Which so they're is all they're all slowing. A bigger yeah. drop off than Meta going from seven to minus one. Nobody says YouTube has a user or, or an engagement problem, but you can see obviously they've been impacted by the macro and IDF IDFA stuff just alongside so, Meta so as well. You wrote that in the second quarter they reported a twenty two percent increase in expenses on a one percent decline <laughs> in revenues. Uh oh. That's a problem. This mismatch has been on display for some time, which explains why corporate EBIT margins have declined by a thousand basis points. This was manageable situation for Meta when revenues were growing by 31% a year, but when revenue growth meaningfully slows, that becomes a major problem. So let right. me ask you this. A lot of this, this bottom line stuff is due to what they're doing with the Meta stuff. If they nest tomorrow, hey, you know what? We're just, bailing. Just kidding. We're gonna, no we're, more We're going to kill that. Would the stock be up 20%? I think it would probably go up, but I don't. I, I don't think it addresses the problem that most people have, which is the the core business. Do people actually believe that it has a future? Okay, why did Sheryl Sandberg leave? I think it was just the end of her run. I don't think there was more Come to on. it than that. There, why was it the end of her? I mean, all right, you want to play? She games? was just there for a while. Why was it the end of her run? <laughs> I mean, there's been some reporting that other things were going on, but um, well, I, they went after her for her wedding expenses. That yeah. seems like a cover. Uh, yeah. Well, she was trying to get some things uh, uh, covered over with her. some reporting. She too. should. <laughs> <laughs> she should. This is this is a woman that probably works twenty hours a day. Sure. I think they should pay for a f***ing wedding. Yeah. Um. All right. But she left, and she's really like the person. Yeah. She was important. Like very sure. very important. Yeah. She, did, didn't she like single handedly build the business of Facebook? She was very prominently involved. For so sure. like if you're if you're like trying to be bullish on it or you're invested in it, like is she even replaceable? And if so, like is there somebody that's going to have his respect and his ear? And be able to like talk him out of some of the like clearly insane shit that he wants to do. Like, is there anybody that powerful that's going to come along and fill that role that she's uh, left? I think it's partly shareholders, honestly, and other outside forces. Okay, so let that. me stop you. They have no votes. Yeah, but again, look what he did in Q1, where he he they literally came out and said we're not just going to. And again, it's starting from a very big base, so point taken. But they're saying we're not going to just grow the losses in FRL. In perpetuity, the only way we'll do it is if there's growth on the FOA side. So he's not listening. All right, I get that. Income. So he's not listening to what shareholders are saying. He's looking at what shareholders are doing potentially, and they're yes. and they're selling. Yes. And so, okay. what, so what is the bull case at this point? Is it just is it just valuation? Not just. I mean, that's obviously a compelling case. But is that it? I mean, the bull case is that the core business is actually sustainable over time, and that the FRL stuff will have some value. If they if they just, I mean, it's at ten now. If they run that up to fifteen, twenty billion expenses, and you go, yeah, a yeah. year. And you go five, 10 years and you just burn $100 billion, $200 billion, and you get nothing out of it. It makes it very difficult for this to be a good investment. Okay. What if, what if instead of ditching the metaverse, uh -huh. an immediate catalyst that I think would add 20% to the stock in one day, spinning off Instagram? Don't, yeah, you think, don't you think everybody wants this? I mean, again, it depends. It seems a lot of people are concerned about what Instagram's future looks like and and how valuable that part of the business they is. They should have so done it. They should have done it a year ago. It probably would have got a higher valuation a year ago. Both pieces <laughs> yeah. would have worked out. I think for both pieces. Yeah, I mean, again, it's funny to put this all in context. At the end of the day, the overall business, the revenue base is like one percent below where it's. Yeah. I mean, this is still a hundred and twenty billion dollar a year business, which is kind of crazy to it's think a monster. about. Monster. Yeah. And it makes, you know, again, the, the FOA business, the core business makes over $50 billion a year, which is in, in profit, in operating profit. You know what would be funny, actually? <laughs> you know how they could drop the stock 20% in one day? Hmm. We're getting into a uh, streaming video. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they're, they're, they're being pretty aggressive with share buybacks. So yeah. they had 2.9 billion shares outstanding. 
uh, towards the end of 2018, it's now down to 2.68. Yeah. So a fairly material decrease. And they just authorized, I think, a 50, 40 or $50 billion share repurchase program. Yeah. But is that offsetting all the stock-based comp that they have to do? Yes. And that's definitely part of it. Yeah. I mean, and again, they're, they're at a position now where the core business, the profitability is coming in, partly just from that mismatch between revenues and expenses we were talking about, but also the huge investments they're making in AI and ML and stuff like that to to really evolve what the platforms are. Then you add on the, the FRL losses as well. You know, this company generates a lot, lot of cash, but that can change fairly so quickly. So I thought <laughs> Alphabet did something very smart years ago that I think would work at Meta, where they brought in a CFO away from Silicon Valley. They brought in Ruth Porat from mm -hmm. Morgan Stanley. Yeah. And she's not, you know, a dreamer. She's just like a get shit done CFO from right. Wall Street, from the East Coast, who brought in discipline. And then simultaneously, they took a lot of these moonshot investments they were making and they put them in a garage somewhere. Mm -hmm. And they called that segment of the business other bets. Yeah. And now when they report, they're reporting segment level. They're giving you YouTube and here's what's going on with Office and here's – right? Yeah. And then other bets. And they've like conditioned Wall Street to like disregard everything they hear mm -hmm. about other bets as long as like the expense level of that mm -hmm. stays reasonable. Right. Which I think is Ruth's job to communicate. Like right. we have to invest in these bets. And we know they're doing like um, quantum computing and self-driving cars and rocketry and all kinds of shit. And nobody expects anything from that unit. Zuckerberg went the other way. Right. Not only did he not carve this out into an other bets, he changed the name of the whole company <laughs> right. to this. Like, I feel like that's a really interesting case study uh, mm -hmm. between those two approaches. Yeah. So Alphabet is getting away with literally burning money. Mm -hmm. And Zuckerberg has this massive business he's getting no credit for because he's burning probably an equivalent amount to what Alphabet is. Yeah. Maybe it's a little bit more. I don't really know the numbers. If you but. had to give a percentage of the decline being responsible for the core business slowing and or the other shit that they're doing, is that 70, 30, 80, 20? What do you think? Oh, do that's you, a good question. Since since they first kind of broke it out, which yeah, I think like, was Q3 how, how much year. How much is the metaverse weighing on it versus the core business slowing down? I think the recent pressure is definitely been more of just the core business and you know broader advertising pressure everywhere. But I think them starting to go through this period, a lot of it was, again, people thought the number... The number I'd heard before they actually disclosed it was two, three, maybe five billion a year. And they came out and said it lost more than ten billion dollars in twenty one. It's crazy. So it was a it was a massive number. And again, at the start there was no guardrails. And they also on did this at this the top. Going. They did yeah. this at the they also did not that they have any control over that, but they did this meta thing literally at the apex of a ten year tech bull market. Yeah. Where any, anything goes one right. second, and then the next day everybody's like, cash flow. Yeah. And it's like yeah, the reasonable, just started. <laughs> the reasonable middle ground for them here that works and probably works for shareholders as well is for them to come out and say, we've been clear from day one that this is a 10-plus year – for this to be a real business is 10 years down the road. We have to recognize the reality of what's happening with the core business right now, even if it's just macro, and we're going to pull in some of the spend to kind of live to that financial framework that we laid out, which is overall operating it and growth for the company. So if so, you think that weakness in the core advertising business is primarily the reason for the stock price being depressed, then do you also have to believe that that will get better in order to stay bullish? Yeah, I mean, you need the secular eventually, ad. Eventually, yeah. <laughs> you need like the the overall ad spending environment to improve. Yeah, that could be. It could be a while. I don't. I mean, who who knows? But, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, for them specifically too, they have to kind of reprove some of the. The, what made the business so strong. Which so it's not like them pulling market. a rabbit out of a hat. They just, the the, the environment has to improve yeah. and then this stock has room to move. I mean, I yeah. do believe it's cheap stock. Yeah. So what's the valuation now? 17? Um, I mean, it depends how you think about what they're going to earn, but they they could earn $40 billion in operating income, something like that. I don't know what the market cap is. So today, it's like, what's the market cap? 500? It's got somewhere around there. They I mean, have, it's not bad. They have so that's 50 a, in cash. So yeah. that's a that's a very it's a it's a very, very cheap stock in yeah. a sector that's not known for having cheap stocks. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm bullish. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not rooting against you, though. I don't care either way. All right. Uh, we're going to- You put this in here, right? I could be wrong, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this may be literally- laugh The worst out. advice ever. This may be laugh out loud. Before we get to our last topic, I want to ask you, you having fun? Yeah, like doing the show. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. All right. Uh, so I want to ask. I want to just throw this out to you guys. This was a Wall, uh, was a Wall Street Journal. Yeah. 
<laughs> Holy shit. This guy's a professor. All right. This is a Wall Street Journal article where they ask 20 experts for what they could do to a 60-40 portfolio or whatever. Uh, all right, here. Stocks are down. Inflation is high and recession may be 20 looming. ideas for adjusting your stock and bond portfolio. 20 ideas for adjusting your stock and bond portfolio. They didn't say good ideas. They didn't say good ideas. Some, you yeah, know, just ideas. <laughs> <laughs> some of these were, some of these were okay. And I actually have some friends who have been quoted in this. So, uh, you know who's in this? What's his name from St. Louis that I like? Uh, Peter. Peter. He's in this. Peter Lazaroff. Uh, this some, all right. This is the worst shit I ever heard. <laughs> well, wait. Maybe maybe it's not, and I have it wrong. I wanted to ask you guys. I'm just going to read this, okay? Yeah, go, go, go for right. it. Most working age people's biggest economic asset is not their already accumulated savings, but their future wages. Wage growth has low correlation with stock returns, so future wages represent a huge implicit fixed income holding. That means most people should hold close to 100% of the money they don't need to cover regular monthly expenses and stocks. I'm sort of okay with that for young Just, people, but that's not even the part that I have a problem with. <laughs> He's basically saying, look, no at, yeah, okay. look at your salary like a bond. So then your portfolio should be stocks. All right, fine. Wait, it gets worse. <laughs> A wrinkle to the above advice is that when stock market volatility is extremely high, as it has been, really extremely high, okay, uh, it can make sense to temporarily scale back one's stock positions. Time out. <laughs> <laughs> That's because the market's average return doesn't increase when volatility is high. So the market is a relatively bad deal during those times. I mean, that's true. Oh, in the Lord. short term, in the short term, that's like true. Like in hourly terms, that's that true. Could be true. The next part, this is the coup de grace. This is too much for me almost. Yeah. Um, this is a professor at Yale. It's just so everyone. <laughs> and, and I literally laughed to myself when I read this. Okay. When the VIX, the market's forecast of the S&P 500 volatility over the next month, rises above 30, start thinking about modestly reducing my stock exposure. In the early summer, I scaled back my stock positions by five percentage points. When the VIX hit its all-time high of 83 in March 2020, I reduced my stock holdings by 80 percentage points. Wow. <laughs> but but he's, he's why like is this guy saying in the Wall Street I sold at the bottom? Why is this guy confessing to <laughs> finance crimes? But be aware that high volatility episodes are usually short-lived. So if you do sell stocks in response to a volatility spike, you need to be attentive and ready to come back into the market quickly as soon as volatility has calmed down. This guy's basically like panic. He has to be fired. And then, and then panic again. He has, to be fi he has to be fired from the school immediately. 100% like, equities and then go to 80% Dude, cash. hold on. When the VIX ran up, he dropped his stock holdings by 80 percentage yeah. points. And then when the market calmed down, he bought it back. What are we yeah. doing here? We got to see his returns. No, you sell low, you buy high. Hello. We got to see his returns. He definitely has tenure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but why would you why would you put this in writing and then ask somebody at the Wall Street Journal to publish it? Yeah, I don't know what he's trying to get at. Um there's 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 a, oh, I was just saying there's a, there's a non zero percent chance that he's joking. He's trolling. But, but it worked. But he but he's probably not kidding. Unless he's totally kidding. Is he what kind of professor? <laughs> professor Professor of Finance? Get the f out of here. <laughs> All right. Maybe there's more to it and they edited it out. Also, there's a 2% chance he's kidding. Just totally kidding. <laughs> I, yeah, I hope. That, that's the most logical answer. All right. <laughs> Favorites. No more, no more character assassination. Jeez. That's not nice. I've written, I've probably written stupider things. Uh, I'm going to go first. Roger Lowenstein is a badass. You know who he is? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know. Uh, of course, he, wrote, he wrote a Buffett book. Yeah. Amongst other great things. Some he's, would say the Buffett. I think he's written Buffett like book, 20 right? books. Which one? Uh, I think it's called Buffett. Some people say it's the best one. Uh, Some people get pissed when you say it's the best why? one. Why? Because of the, the snowball. snowball. The snowball is such a more Well, the, the Lowenstein one book, Lowenstein one is Buffett for people that aren't psychos, like yeah. finance psychos. Yes. Like Snowball is great, but it's like 600 pages. Yeah, and the the Lowenstein one's like a business book. The the, the Alice Schroeder one's it's like personal. a much more personal yeah. book. Uh, uh, yeah. So Lowenstein has a sub stack that I don't think most people know he's doing this. Yeah. It's called Intrinsic Value. It's way better than Alex Morris' sub stack. <laughs> uh, no, it's like free. It, it doesn't look like he's like looking for paid subs or anything. I just feel like he wanted a place to put his thoughts. Yeah. And I think it started during the pandemic. Yeah, I follow his. And uh, you, you read it? Yeah. It's great. Anyway, he's got a really great piece up um, from August 10th, so just published, called Policy and Trade-Offs. And basically what he's laying out is the fact that we have a perfectly botched trade-off 
in the form of allowing private equity to keep its carried interest loophole, which makes absolutely no sense when you think about where that money comes from, but taxing buybacks as though they're somehow like a cause of some sort of problem or that by taxing it, we're going to reduce inflation somehow. Of course, all of that is nonsense. Yeah. Um, but I, I thought that this was a really good piece. And the gist of what he's saying is that the carried interest uh, loophole that's being preserved is not about PE funds taking risk or private equity investors taking risk. Nobody has any problem with that. What he's saying is that the so-called carried interest is coming from the profits that have been earned by the investors on their investors' own capital. So it's not coming out of any risk that anyone's taking. It's fees being paid to the firm, and then the firm is getting preferential tax treatment on those fees. That's the part that makes it ludicrous. Mm. So I mm. thought it was a really it was a really good explainer. And basically what he's saying is – I'll quote him and then we're done with this. There is no justification for this break. I will not invest less money in a fund managed by KKR or Blackstone on account of the tax – that is later imposed on the fee that KKR or Blackstone charges me. After I pay my fee, I couldn't care less what happens to it. The tax break does not create an incentive. Exactly. So private equity would probably still be investing other people's money if they had a higher tax rate. Uh -huh. And none of this does anything for the end user at all. So anyway, I thought, I thought it was a really good take. Um, we won't get into the buyback stuff, but he is against the buyback tax for the same reason that I am. Um, yeah, what do you got? The talk around buybacks is fascinating, especially in politics. It's a litmus, te it's a litmus test of who you, of of like who you hate more. Right? Do you hate corporate America and the investor class more or less? That right? I've, yeah. I've, I mean, just so much of the commentary on it just isn't even logical. But I mean, when it comes from politicians, we're gonna. It makes it sound like something that is. It's it's fairly straightforward what it actually is in terms of what the company's doing with it. Fun, do you think they'll funds, stop? Do you think they'll stop at one percent excise tax on buybacks? It's got to sure go up, right? I'm sure if they start going, they'll probably go higher over time. It's got to go higher. Yeah, because it's probably it's another lever they can pull. Yeah. Um, where it's almost victimless from in their yeah. eyes. I mean, I can't remember who said it. Someone said, "I hate buyback." Some politician. I hate buybacks. Elizabeth That's Warren, probably. Such an odd thing to say. Well, I hate dividends. <laughs> fat <Right>. cats. <laughs> these just fat, very odd thing to say fat cats. to me. Uh, all right. What do you got for favorites, Michael? Uh, Brawl and Cell Block 99. What is that? If you know, you know. I don't know. Right, Duncan? <laughs> yeah. Doesn't look like my kind of movie. Okay. This is a movie? That's a movie. Okay. What's it called? Just, just Google it. <laughs> How many Academy Awards is this up for? Well, let me just tell you, it made $70,000 at the box office. Wow. In 2017. <laughs> is, this a, is this a real movie? Where do you watch? Where do you watch something like this? Amazon Prime, oh, of course. Um, but my known. real favorite thing this week, uh, uh, Industry is back. I, I, I enjoy that show. Industry is about. I never saw it. First never year investment it. bankers in London, and yeah. uh, I enjoy it. It's good. HBO Max. Hmm. You yeah. never saw it either. What's that? You ever watch this? Anybody? No. Let me say. That's a movie. What is this shit? <laughs> oh, it's like it's like so bad. It's good. No, it's. Uh, is that uh, Michael Caine? No, it's the girl from Dexter. It's Vince Vaughn. It's the girl from Dexter. It's unironically good. Wait, is that Michael Caine? No, it's 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 a uh, oh Terrence Stamp. But that's Don Johnson. That's who that is. <laughs> that's the old British guy, is Terrence Stamp. That's the guy that takes all the roles that Michael Caine is too busy for. No, <laughs> no, no. It's this guy. Oh, it's the guy from Game of Thrones. It's this guy. You've seen him before. His name is Udu Kier. He's like the weirdo in all these like gross movies. He's he's the sparrow, high sparrow. Oh uh, yeah, in, right. Yeah, and tomorrow never dies. He, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the he's the high sparrow in Game of Thrones. Okay, I'm in. I'll watch it. It's How, grisly. What else do I have? What else do I have going on in my life? <laughs> and, Alex, Alex, what are you getting up to? Yeah, give us your give us your favorite thing right now. What did you watch on the uh, flight? It's gonna be hard to top Michael's, but try. I listen to a lot of podcasts on the flight. I've been watching Stranger Things, finally catching up, and it's it's good. I can see how it, uh, it can get a wide audience, I guess. It's not it's not really You're a my, Stranger Things guy, right? It's not in my wheelhouse, yeah, I, but I, I can watch, watch it. it. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was better than the third season or the previous season. I like that they are using it to bring back like uh, Kate Bush songs from the 80s. Yeah, they That's helped kinda, her a lot. It's kind of dope. <laughs> I like that. Uh, what podcast do you listen to? Obviously, The Compound and Friends. What else? The Compound. Uh, my good buddy, Bill Brewster. Business Brew. I listen to that one a lot. What is it called? Business Brew? The Business Brew. Okay. Yeah. Who does he, what does he do? Uh, he just interviews. Uh, you know, he, had, uh, he interviews fund managers and okay. you know, tons of different kinds of people. Okay. Um, 
I listen to a, a bunch of random podcasts now that I just find through Spotify. I was listening to something on Fix Wireless on the way up here. Apparently, same fiber industry has a podcast. No, I mean, kidding. everybody has a podcast. Uh, he listens to <laughs> Alex listens to Tim Dillon with us. Tim Dillon. Oh yes, I it's love Tim pod- Dillon. Honestly, he is he is getting better. This is such being on a podcast that he's been on. It's like one of my greatest. Yo, I, I, I should, I should, so I should have thrown this on as a favorite, but he just had Curtis, Curtis Yarvin on. The, yeah. Did you listen to that? I, I, who was, I, I listened to part shit. of it. I don't, who is that guy? He's like, I, they talk about doing acid, but he's like, um, a blogger who huh. like rose to prominence because he's like pro monarchy. Huh. And he like does these historical deep dives on why America basically should just admit that it's always been a monarchy and like do it for real and mm. just have like another FDR or JFK type president come in and just start acting like a king again. Mm-hmm. And he's it's like deeper than that. I'm not I'm huh. not, I, I can't do it justice, but it's an hour and a half of Tim Dillon and Tim Dillon doesn't get a word in because <laughs> this guy just goes and this guy mm-hmm. is like dropping shit from like ancient Rome and it's just it's really very entertaining. Uh all right, I'm with you on uh I'm with you on Tim Dillon. We wanted to make one announcement about um the merch store, idonshop.com. What were we supposed to say? So we're asking people to to tag us on social media um wearing their merch. Oh yeah. Nicole gets really excited if you are rocking the compound merch, if you have the hat or the shirt or whatever, and you tag us on Instagram, on Twitter, whatever. Nicole gets fired up. What are we going to do for the people that do that? We'll come up with something. Share it. No, I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking like a bed and breakfast with Duncan, like yeah. a weekend getaway. <laughs> sure. We'll reshare you. We'll reshare you if you shout us out. So make sure you go ahead and do that. It's idonshop.com. It's idonshop.com. If you liked Alex's uh, talking, you'll like his writing even better. Mm. Yeah, drop, much better writer than talker. Drop your <laughs> drop your email into our link. Links in the show notes, YouTube, everywhere, everywhere. We we also have a review. Oh, let's read. do the review. So uh, today's is from Cool Philly Mommy. And uh, like the, right. the title is High Octane. The knowledge I have gained from this dynamic duo, Josh and Michael, is remarkable. The well-chosen guests add to each week's unique experience. I feel as if I've gained a coach in my pocket to keep me grounded during this challenging market. I so can't wait to rock, to rock my workout with each new episode. Would love to take you to a dinner at one of our city's coolest restaurants with unmatched sky-high views. Keep crushing it. Is that oh from Philly from Philadelphia? I guess that's, an, that's a nice review, but like uh, it's funnier when you read the bad ones. They have this. <laughs> they have yeah. It's true. They have this restaurant tour that do, who dominates Philly. This guy Steven Starr. Uh, I think Budokan started in Philadelphia. They have like some like it's not just cheesesteaks. They have like cu- cu- cuisine in uh f- oh, sprinkles call me all right let's wrap it up from here i want to say thank you to everybody uh thanks for your patience while we took two weeks off it was much needed duncan went to london i went to italy michael went to parsippany and uh we kind of all just need a little bit of a break but we're back big show coming up next week all big shows coming up actually this whole fall we are going to mow you down with talented people like alex morris so stick around and we will see you next time <laughs>